Hello and welcome to Merlin Leadership Unplugged. The reason I wanted to create this podcast is to show everybody that leadership is accessible, achievable and something that everybody can do in their lives if they want to. In this podcast, we will focus on sharing some amazing stories from inspirational leaders both within Merlin and outside and stories that will help us all connect and relate with that journey. I hope you find this a great learning opportunity, that you enjoy listening to these stories and that you can see that anybody can be a leader if they choose to. Enjoy. My guest today is Huel Mathias, and I hope I got that right. And if I haven't, he's going to tell me. Uh, Huel is uh, one of my very favorite leaders in Merlin for a couple of reasons. He always approaches his conversations with a coaching style. He's a great people manager that really, really promotes his team and wants them to do amazingly well and keep on developing. He will always find time for you and he doesn't believe in the saying, oh, I'm too busy, everybody's too busy. Uh, And he will give you actual quality time every time you have a question, whether it's a silly one or a big business one. So for all of those reasons and for more that you will uh, hear about in this podcast today, welcome Huel. Thank you. That's incredibly nice. So welcome to Merlin Leadership Unplugged. And I really wanted to start with, um, you know, that conversation we had about this podcast when I was getting ready to like record Fiona and I was talking to you about it and um, you talked about kind of your journey into leadership and and how you got here today. Um, And you shared a story with me that was uber inspirational. And the reason it was uber inspirational is because I am the mother of a neurodiverse child. And you you shared a really wow story about neurodiversity and how you dealt with it. Okay. And I really would love to start with that, if that's okay with you. So I, I thought we'd get there somewhere in this chat. <laughs> Let's I hadn't start thought, with that. I hadn't thought that's where we were going to start. Um, so um, I grew up with dyslexia. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, um, well, let's, let's take it back right at the beginning. So I went to school, found school very, very challenging, went mm. to a very nice private school. My parents really fought out everything they could to try and get me from a world that they were into a different world. And at the end of, I guess, my second year, I was, um, I was sat on what they used to call, horrible term, the special needs table or the oh special table. There was a so table. So they used to call you, and they used to call you by your surname as well. So they used to say special needs Matthias. That was an actual phrase in that the school the at that point. And this was early 80s, early oh, 80s. Wow. And, uh, um, and so my parents knew this was wrong, took me out of the school, didn't quite know what to do, um, moved me to a different, um, to a different school. And I, the same kind of issues reoccurred. I still couldn't. Sort of, I, I guess I couldn't. My reading age wasn't getting to the right level. My ability to write wasn't at the right level. I almost had this an intellect was, that was maybe two or three years ahead of my capability, um, and uh, um, and that clearly is frustrating. Mm. As a kid, when you don't you don't understand why you're different, mm. you don't know what makes you different, um, but you know you are, and you also know every single day. Not not a phrase I use now for myself but a phrase I would have used then about you know you're not good enough mm. and you just know you're not good enough because everything you do doesn't translate. And so I guess lots of people experience stuff like that in their lives regardless of what their, um, regardless of their background, capability, etc. But uh, um, for me, that sort of continued till I was about seven or eight and um, my parents ended up getting to the point they were so frustrated. Mm. They took me out and took me to, a, um, to be assessed to try and work out what was going on, to try and understand it a little bit better. And um, the outcome of that was I had this weird day in in a room where um, I had to look at loads of different pictures and say what they meant to me, and I had to look at loads of different letters and explain uh, what they looked like and look at Bs next to Ds and Ds next to Ps and try and see if there was any difference in in all of them. And I I came out of it well and truly diagnosed as dyslexic, (laughs) no doubt, um, very good. I remember being in the room and suddenly getting this rush of like, almost this rush of power, this sense that I know it, I get it, I can explain it, I understand what's going on. Um, And I felt like amazing. Um, And we went home, my parents got me dyslexia tutor, all very much spurred on by my mum, who's like my hero in every aspect of my life, but in this moment was absolutely my hero. And 
And then I went to school um, with my parents um, to explain to the head teacher what was going on, to explain what needs I had in school. So um, it was stuff like extra time around reading. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. Could I get a bit more one-to-one time on reading? Could I get a bit more one-to-one time in terms of writing? And actually, um, weird to tell this to the entire organisation because it's not something I talk about a lot, but uh, um, the headmaster stood in a room with me, again, sign of the times versus today, and said, that's all well and good, Mr Matthias, Mrs Matthias, but we don't, we, we don't accept dyslexia in this county. It's not recognised. Oh, it's wow. not understood. Your son in this county is uneducatable. And to this day, it is probably the singly most defining conversation that I will ever be in. Because I, I was there, having spent loads of years knowing that I couldn't keep up with other people in that space. Um, and I was there in a room... And I think when I told you this story, my um, my next sentence had a big swear word in it. It's not going to go. We're not going to go there um, today. But it, I I thought the equivalent of whatever an eight year old. I, I basically I stood there, sat stood there, sorry, thinking it's not true. I've spoken to this amazing person who's explained what's going on. I understand the difference between me and other people. Mm-hmm. I also understand there's various steps I need to take to get to a a different place. And I thought. <laughs> sod, <Bugger off. laughs> sod you let's use that phrase or whatever the equivalent is and that feeling that I got that day of knowing that um, you're not defined by what someone else's perception of you is yeah. you're not pers- defined by the state of the organisation you're in you're defined by what you can do for yourself and the power you get from knowing that you can be better or different or bolder and um, that pretty much defined my career um, and my life e- ever since. And I, I don't think there'll ever be a time that I won't be um, as grateful for that conversation as I was probably upset by it at the time, or that I won't be as grateful for having dyslexia um, as, I, as I've been hindered by it. I think it probably, for many, many years, was the problem that stopped me from getting somewhere. And over time, because of the way the brain works, because of the different ways I look at things, mm. it, effectively it's my superpower and it's mm. something I'm really proud of now. Um, and so I'm guessing that's the right story. <laughs> that is the story. Because I, I went home that night and I thought for the first time um, about my son's neurodiversity in a very different way. Okay. And up until that day having the conversation with you... It was all about the things that we need to do to, to evolve things, to fix things, to improve things. And that day, I thought of an incident that he, he had done many years ago where uh, he had gone to the bathroom and he wanted to dry his hands. And he went to dry his hands and I was just observing. And there was like two hand dryers next to each other and he just went one hand a- under each. And I looked and I thought, gosh, I'm in my late 30s. I've never thought to do that before. Yeah. Why have I only ever used one hand dryer at the time? But it was it was the first time I correlated the whole, I'm going to use this as my superpower yeah, yeah. rather than I'm going to allow it to be my obstacle in life. Um, and it really stayed with me. And I think a lot of people hearing this will will connect with that story. So well, I kind of hope so. I mean, it's, it's a simple story. It's a story like thousands hundreds of thousands of people have had but it is the genuine truth and i think we're in a world now where in most schools in most markets that that people will be treated differently yeah we'll have different experiences and i actually think there'll be a point in the future where um the normalization of this it it will be completely normalized and that people won't have the experiences that i had but it it's you can't you can't take those moments as problems you've got to think about them We've got to acknowledge what they are, accept them. I mean, to this day, anybody getting an email from me may get a sentence that makes totally no sense. And I might have read that twice. But now they know why. But because (laughs) in my my head, I know exactly what it says and I can read it as what it says. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that's not every day. Um, But... um, but you just have to you have to get to a point that you move on from it being a problem and yeah. and hearing your story is kind of like that's yeah i and and I think it's it's especially difficult for parents that get a diagnosis like that for their yeah, for their child is. because you your kind of primary role in life is i want to give them the best provide the best like your parents did yeah. they wanted you to go to private school they wanted to give you the absolute everything they could and I think the best thing they've done is 
to get you that diagnosis to so you knew what you were dealing with well, it's kind of like it's, well, firstly i think parents want to protect and yeah. look after don't they and actually um there's almost a risk that you go into a point of protecting and looking after someone mm. as opposed to thinking how, how how can they be brilliant what and empower them and i guess it's just that's why i was very lucky my mom had been a teacher um she was also just the type of person that did all that stuff naturally yeah so for me i, I was lucky in a way some other people weren't um yeah, no, I, th- I think it's as simple as that. Whether if you've got something that makes you different, you work out what's brilliant about it and you try and use it. I love that. You you turn it into your superpower rather than your yeah. obstacle. I, I love that. Um, I even told that story to my husband and he said, oh, I think I need to meet him That's and cute. say, well done. No, I loved it. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of that story that my parents wanted something different for me yeah, than yeah, what, yeah. what they did. T- talk to me about Huel before university and before Merlin. <laughs> what was the family like? What is what is the family, family set up? Like? Um, so, well, four kids in our family. My parents were from um, small town, South Wales. Um, they were the first people from that small town to move out of small town, South Wales and go to big, scary London. Um, they um, had to fight. They had to fight for everything. So um, they, they will have slowly built themselves a lives that lo- lots of people are born into so we had a we had a childhood where um it was wonderful it was noisy um you know when you sit at a table there's certain people that will politely put food on their plate and there's people that will grab for whatever's in front of them when you're like one of six around a table like it it's it, it and the table was the center of our lives right it was every single night you'd sit down around a table and the food would be poured out it'd be put down and you'd all grab for it you'd go for it and there'd be conversation and debate um and those debates would happen, yeah, like sometimes for like half an hour, sometimes for a couple of hours. It was like a, a really quite close family. Um, and then we started to move and move and move. So my parents then moved us, I think went to six schools, something like that in total. In your, in your education yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, partly a couple of moves at the beginning for the yeah. reasons I was talking about before. But um, also then just cause my, my dad's moved with jobs one place and another so we never really had any sort of fixed mm-hmm. location that um we were in but um no very happy very great great family very lucky in many ways and what did your dad do he was a surveyor so he ran property um, portfolios for different and your mom a teacher well she 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 was a teacher um taught in very posh private schools which <laughs> i think think is why she got this silly idea that she should send me to one which was never going to be my environment um but then went on um, in the latter sort of last 10, 15 years of her um, life to run charities. So we moved, they moved back to South Wales when we all moved to um, up where we went off. We were scattered all over the place, um, having never had a sort of fixed location. I guess that's quite normal, isn't it? Yeah. To then not sort of all home back into one place. But uh, um, she went off and um, worked for the church and um, created charity centres um, for people who... Um, grew up in poverty and trying to teach them sort of loads of life skills, educate them, um, enable them to um, move into their first jobs often, um, sometimes work with people who who hadn't necessarily even learned how to wean their own children, all kinds of stuff, going into houses where people were drug addicts, etc. just creating family centres, bringing communities together and then trying to create a different life for them. What a woman. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Genuinely. Quite the inspiration in your life. Yeah, one of the, one of the big ones, one of the big ones. Uh, in terms of how you should be as a person, a hundred percent. Yeah, and then you grow up in that loud, noisy, very loving, very energetic family environment, and then at some point, school finishes, and what do you do next? So I went to university in Manchester. Um, great city to go to university for anyone who's not been to university. One of the, one of the great great cities. Um, um, but worked all the way through it to fund it myself. So did loads and loads and loads of work um, um, in hospitality. So whether that was big hotel events, um, race events, um, race courses, sports events, etc. Um, and also working in bars um, just to sort of get through to, to, to do that over the year. Fell in love with interacting with people um, in that environment. Um, always had a massive hankering for food and th- thought that that's where my career was going to go and um, so moved to London did a graduate program like lots of people do went and worked bizarrely of all places for Network Rail 
I did that because they had a great scheme, loads of different opportunities, um, and I needed, if I'm honest, I needed to pay off my student debt. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was one of those simple decisions. They gave you quite a big signing, signing on bonus and a great uh, and a great training program, but probably, in truth, wasn't ever where I wanted to spend my life. Mm. Um, and so, um, worked in their commercial team, so um, putting retail onto stations um, for a number of, for a number of years, and then moved from that team into one of the operations, so a company called Marks and Spencers that's big in the UK. Yeah. We, uh, um, I moved into their operation, ran some of their food businesses and eventually came here for what I thought, I think I thought was a couple of years at Chessington as their food and beverage lead, um, recruited by Mike Vallis back in the day. Oh, um, wow. Very, very 15, 15 years ago. Um, and then the rest has been Merlin ever since. So the last 15 years have been in this magical, crazy, Indeed. in a good way, organisation. <laughs> and you start from FMB. Yep. And now what you do is global strategy for, you know, all of our midway attractions. Talk to me about that journey, because it must have been a number of roles, global, yeah, local, um, UK, abroad. Well, I, I guess like the starting point is I've never said no yet. Um, mm, to <laughs> so, an opportunity. So it's just like whenever anything's come up, I kind of thought we'll give it a go. So very, very quick whistle stop tour, um, head of food and beverage, commercial director at Chessington, open Man Swords in Sydney. Um, so you worked experience. in Australia? Yeah, yeah. So I was there for a, a couple of years. Um, then got asked to do a couple of weeks over in Hong Kong to do some integration work um, with the new businesses in Shanghai, Bangkok, Korea, and was there for a year. The two weeks ended up being 12 months. Yeah, yeah. Which, <laughs> As you did. Which, yeah, it was slight, slightly irritating for my partner at the time, but <laughs> these things happen, right? Hey. Um, so did that for a year um, and then had lots of contemplation about what to do next, but wanted to come back to the UK. Mm -hmm. um, came and ran the dungeon in London. So we just moved it from Tildy Street to next to the Eye. Um, so ran that business for a while. And it, it was almost like the the most unusual problem, which we just had way too many people coming. We couldn't fit enough people in. We had four-hour queues outside. Oh, wow. um, so we had this opportunity to start playing with, how do you play with price? How do you play with your ticketing systems? What do you do to, apps, to flatten demand across the day? When you flatten demand across the day, what then happens to guest experience? Because if you queue less time to get in, your guests have a way better time. Your teams enjoy working there a lot more because they haven't got to deal with people who've waited three hours to get in. Um, and then we started overlaying revenue management into it in a, in a sort of very rudimentary early way. Mm -hmm. So it was just one of those moments where I guess the way in which you operated became focused on a very different thing. Mm. Um, and I remember, um, I always talk about this, the things that make me most excited is pulling a team of people around a problem, getting them to analyse it, work out what the right thing to do is, and then build a plan to make it better. And it's the bit where everything gets better, improves and improves and improves that really excites me. And so... So that sort of experience in the dungeon has then probably informed a lot of what I do today. Because I, I moved then temporarily into um, into a brand director role for all of the dungeon estate. Um, so me, a marketing director, not anticipated, um, not expected. I got out of there quite quickly because it wasn't necessarily the thing that I was um, best at in my career. Um, and then went on to run the London division for four years. Um, so great role. Um, brilliant team amazing attractions um we we took that business actually we i, I so i inherited it um and it, it had a bit of tough trading we were beginning to turn the curve so we were sort of six months in as a team and we'd done some stuff in pricing we changed the way we were doing the marketing etc cetera, etc cetera, and we were beginning to turn it around and then the um terrorist attacks happened um which of course then led to a world where um fewer people come to central london of course they do um that then really has a massive impact um, on the business. Um, year one, I think I missed budget by 19 million pounds. First time I've ever missed budget. Um, quite quite a transformation then for the team to work out what do we do with the cost base? What do we do um, with our products? How do we change our marketing mixes? What, what, what is it we need to do to, to turn this business around? And then we went on a sort of two year slog of really, really getting to the point that we we turned that business round, and then just as it was sort of coming out, and we were we were about to have the best year London ever ever had. It was like a really great great moment in time. Everyone everyone got the reward for the the hard slog. Um, I got asked about doing this role, which is um, which is like you say a strategy role for for Midway. What was the most exciting 
day in the office of those four years running London Division. Some pretty big global events happened during that time, right? Oh, there was some amazing stuff. It's really hard to pull out anything specific, actually. Just I anything that comes to mind in terms of like a wow moment in, in the job. Do you know what? That's a very good question. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that for you. There was so many. We did everything from big... I mean, we, we hosted royalty on the eye. Amazing. Um, I was thinking there was a lot of royal... M- weddings and babies coming during that time so there, there must there have was, been i mean we we, we launched Mag- uh, Magan, um harry and megan to the world again one of the biggest moments madden saws london ever had um so that was a that was a really cool event um we had justin timberlake come in um promote uh promote shrek down on the south bank just were, casually just, so there was, <laughs> with you, all the stuff that i guess when you work for a company like this feels quite yeah. normal so you asked me the question what's exciting i'm sure if you ask someone externally that question that would be a wow moment well oh, those are three big moments yeah. whereas i'm just like oh, th- th- these things happen don't they in this organization in, in, in merlin land these things happen yeah. but then when you talk to people that don't work here yeah it's not that's that's pretty amazing isn't that true so it's 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 that kind of magic that we take for granted sometimes and then you talk to friends and family and they go you did what today at work yeah, no, that's true. That's very, very true. <laughs> we we kind of, I feel like sometimes we just need to stop and reflect a bit more and go. We think this is the norm. This is not the world that everybody else operates in. It's it's quite the magical place. Um, Fifteen years in one organization, loads of different roles, um, with different challenges and variety and traveling globally. What kept you in love with the business? What kept you going and you know motivated you to? want to do more and in different places and in different roles probably comes back to what i just said though so if you can if you i think running something Mm. and just running it on an ongoing basis doing the same thing every day has to be probably the least fulfilling way you can live your life so if you sort of flip that if you and you think there's always been a different challenge a different a different problem to fix, a different yeah. opportunity to explore. And there's always been different groups of people to do that with. And and it is genuinely the most brilliant thing when you see a bunch of people come around a problem, come up with an answer, and then start changing and improving and getting better. And it's brilliant because you see the business result. It's brilliant because you then see people's careers change. Yeah. And the number of people that I've seen, I mean, I'm very lucky to have had a very diverse relate like the experience here and moved around the organization a lot but the number of people who have seen do the same or come in and pick up a problem area and completely transform it equally there's i I think about some of the the operators in the business and i think how they grew up in finance and then moved into single site and have gone to multi-site and and to just to see the way in which people do brilliant things and then see their careers change has to be it's got to be the most motivating thing that you do. And there's never been a point that Merlin hasn't had more of that. Mm. The, the talent and the development that you see around yeah, you. the opportunity. Yeah. And you, but I feel like you drive that as well as a leader. So whilst you do see it around you and you do welcome it, I feel like actively there is a lot of times, a lot of examples that I can think of where you go, this person just got promoted. They need to go on the induction. They need this. They need that. I feel this would be fantastic for that. You really drive it and you fuel it. You don't just say, oh, yeah, they know where all the training and all the development yeah. is and they know what they need. You, you are the driver of your people's careers, I feel, sometimes. I kind of hope Like it. you really fly the flag for them. See, I'd hope everybody does that. That, for me, would be... I, I, the known I, why, thing. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. It's almost like having a cup of tea in the morning it's like it's normal but I think that's the secret that for you it's unconscious you don't have to like put effort into it or like put it on a to-do list it's something that is true to your personality and you do anyway you want your people to go on an amazing leadership program you want them to be coached you want them to experience Merlin in a different way and you you physically actively drive that yeah but that's I guess it's just where you get energy from isn't it is is it is that your energy listen whether it's someone that works for you or whether it's someone else the number of conversations i have with individuals that either have worked with me or for me in the past or now Mm -hmm. and i still sort of jump in and out of their careers because it's it it it's exciting right it's seeing the difference i'm thinking of a bunch of people and i I won't name them seeing how they've grown in the organization over time like 
that gives you energy, that gives you joy, right? So why would you not spend your time doing it? I, d- I just think you do it so naturally rather than, oh, I must do this because I'm a leader. But it's it, it, it. your ans- be, I 100% hate being complimented, so this is absolutely <laughs> uncomfortable I'll for stop, me. I'll yeah, stop, I'll stop. I'll say all the bad stuff <laughs> yeah, now. Get, yeah, get that out. So um, speaking of which, somebody <laughs> said you have amazing dance moves. Is I, that true or false? I, so were, were, were they <laughs> laughing when they said no. it? No. No, they were genuine. It was, a, gen- it was a genuine. I, I, I went out and asked your team. And I said, what, what do you want to mention? And one of them, so shall remain moves. unnamed, said, I've heard the dance moves are pretty epic. I, Is um, there video evidence of this that we can include in this podcast? I, I, <laughs> I, arguably, yes. I'm not sure it's necessarily something I want to be famous for. But, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> You'll own up to that one. I'll own up to that one. I'll take that one. That's, yeah. that's fair enough. What did you study at university? Bizarrely environmental sciences. Okay. Well, how, how did you go to that? Um, because I could do it academically. Okay, tell me more. And um, the subject. Well, <laughs> so, um, when I got, I, I actually had an all right moment um, in my education with my GCSEs. I kind of um, got to a point where I'd, I'd reached sort of the middle of the pack, mm. um, and then I went to do A levels. And actually, as the um, as the sort of academic level jumped up, I I found it too hard. Mm. It, it didn't work for me. I couldn't quite keep up with it. So um, the one subject that I seemed to do consistently well in was um, environmental sciences. Um, it, it, it was it was the single space that academically I was I was there, um, and so I applied for it. Um, and if I'm honest, you know, lots of people open up their their grades and they go, "Oh, which one of these universities do I go to?" Well, I was like, "Oh, I've got one option, right?" <laughs> so, um, to an extent, it was it was forced by that. I was interested in it. I liked it. I liked the science bit mm. of it more than um, the non-science bit. And actually, probably looking back, the sort of like the reporting, the data, the analysis still stick with me today in terms mm. of the way that I work. Um, and so, I, and actually, again, had a good educational moment in it. I did pretty well. Um, uh, but I think it's because I, I loved it at the time. Um, but at that point, probably I couldn't find something to work in in that space. I don't think I ever really thought it was somewhere I was going to work, mm. completely honestly. Um, I, get, I get too much of a buzz of the... Um, but when I was an operator, uh, of the actual interaction, the front line, the constant change and all the rest of it, I don't think I... It's one of the things I struggle with in my role now is, like, I love what I do. I love the impact that um, we've made across Midway over the last few years. Um, but actually, sometimes it can become quite wearing, being constantly on the analysis, presentation, mm. etc. And actually, you miss the energy you get from that operation. But that then you've got to sort of balance it out with getting site visits, getting out, meeting people, etc. How do you balance it out? So if you, mi- if you crave it, if you miss it, if you know that's an energy point for you or an energy bank... How do you make sure you you have it or you create it? It's a good question because I, I guess quite often, again, it's about pulling people into what the problem is mm. because the way that we... Uh, most of my um, most of my time in this role um, has been across the COVID period and therefore we've been really, really tight oh. and lean on resource. So um, so what I've had to do and what I've, what I've enjoyed doing is pulling the various brilliant people from around the organisation and getting them to do... Um, to come up with the answers and then working with some external agencies just to document it and to bring it into the right the right way of looking at um, a specific problem, whether it be retail or guest experience and management sorts or any other number of things. Um, so it's by getting those people in and getting their opinions and their thoughts. I think that's where I get the energy. And of course, then getting out and seeing sites where you can. Mm. Going back to that kind of interaction. Yeah, yeah. How was having a new job in the middle of COVID? <laughs> Um, and one that's very different to being a divisional director, I, you know isn't what? it? I, I'm not sure that having a new job or an old job or anything or any in job, COVID. It, it, was, it was a whole different world for everybody. Um, I think in many ways it was, um, I mean, it was amazing, wasn't it? Think, think what we did. Think what, what we, we achieved. Did, right? yeah. We went into the singly most difficult period that this business will ever have. Mm. And we came out not just surviving, but having transformed our structures, whole new revenue management strategies, um, amazing clarity across Midway in terms of toolkits, how we deliver um, new websites rolled out everywhere, um, health and safety teams doing like being industry leaders. Like it was an amazing period of time. So if you if you take away all the, the real difficult challenge bits and you focus on 
on the positive, um, which, which of course you have to, we as a team did the most amazing stuff. And we should be really proud of that. And actually, sometimes as we face into problems in the future, we should think a bit more like that against, I don't know, whatever the... F what do we do with digitization of the business going forward? Like, if we actually take that kind of, like, that view that the problem is so huge and immediate, mm. how brilliant can we be in terms of transforming, improving, and growing the business? It's almost like what we can learn from COVID rather than... Yeah, yeah, agreed. We were all locked in and we didn't have a lot of choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, no one's going to want to relive that bit, are they? Yeah, no, no really not. No, and no. Even, even when I was talking to Fiona, she said she found it very difficult to not have that people interaction. It's hard, that really? That is an... Ex like, it's an energy yeah. point for her too. Yeah, it was really hard. It was hard for absolutely everybody. How, how did you manage outside of work? Because I've heard all sorts of stories around, I got a dog, or I started walking loads, or uh, I went into podcasts, yeah. or you know, I binge watch everything on Netflix, or whatever else. I've heard so many iterations. Um, how, how did you manage your energy so, having to work from the environment that is your sanctuary, your home, you know? Well, was it a sanctuary? So um, <laughs> we'd just had the back of our house knocked down at the beginning of COVID. So we'd wow. just taken off. Uh, we live in a small terrace house um, in the centre of Brighton and the whole of the back of it had come off to be, um, to build out a very beautiful, lovely kitchen. And, uh, um, and so we were in a room probably no more than, what, three metres squared through the whole of the first session um or period and uh, um and so like our dog we we couldn't take it out in the back garden because it was all boarded and wow. if, if you let the dog out of that room she'd run downstairs and get underneath the house and run around barking um because of course she was going about stir crazy as we were and um, so i i lived the first period in that um which was i guess how well, on mi <laughs> on microwave meals, which for a foodie is not good, um, we do not recommend. That. I, I, I would not recommend. Like, I don't think I ate anything that had crunch in it for about three months. Oh wow! Um, anything with any texture. But listen, everyone had their own version of horrible, didn't they? Yeah. So um, that was just mine. Um, but I, I've always made sure over the last probably since late 30s I exercise three times a week really hard um I try and eat well I don't drink in the week I uh, um all these things that I try and do to keep myself going um once a month I will go and do 20k minimum walk over the hills I mean I do lots of small walks and stuff but I do it and I, I quite often will do it with one of my friends sometimes on my own and I just love it because it's just really freeing yeah it, it, it silences everything doesn't it yeah it really does um, in this 15-year journey in Merlin, did you have any sort of um, ideas, beliefs, um, preconceived things that you thought, actually, they have really been challenged now? They have changed? I thought this and now it's something different? It's 15 years of life as well mm. as 15 years of Merlin, isn't it? So, I mean, I joined when I was 30. I'm now I'm now 45. Um, With the recently celebrated great birthday. Only just 45. <laughs> only just. And um and so, yeah, of course. Like you, as, as you grow up, you change your opinions. You you learn more. You you get to different views on the same things. Um, so of course there will be no, all the way through that journey. There will be things that have been challenged and changed. Um, you work for different people. Mm. When you work for different people, you get a different lens on the same problem. Um, you get a different way of looking at it. Um, and if you don't learn as you go, well, you probably get quite stuck quite quickly. Mm. Um, but equally, you you work with other people, colleagues, or even your teams. And I, t I, I, I run an e-commerce team today. I, I, I clearly know some stuff about it. Um, I'm just very lucky to have a brilliant individual that looks after that for me. So you have to continuously learn and change your thinking um, on everything. And I think we're about to go through a period of time where we're mm. going to evolve and change again. Yes. So I, I think there's loads... What's of happened? What's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, what's um, changed? What, does it, what, what happens when you get a new chief exec? But, um, but it, of course it's great, and that's what business should be. You yeah. don't want to stay in, in one place, do you? But uh, um, it's great that we've got that opportunity to look to what's next, to what's different. Um, it's really clear to have three really bold 
strategic statements and think about how we do those things. And so it'll be really exciting for anybody. I mean, there's been so much opportunity for so many individuals over the 15 years I've been here to, as I say, come do great work, have great careers, move on, go to different places, um, do different things. And that's just going to continue, isn't it? It's just going to be done in through a slightly different lens in a slightly different way. Scott came to um, see the Excalibur group a couple of weeks ago in Chesington and one of his opening statements was, I'm a change junkie. Yeah. And I know it and I love it and I appreciate not everybody is. Are you on that page? I, don't, well, <laughs> if, if my I had a feeling if, you if, might if be my, on the same page. If my answers haven't given you that, then <laughs> maybe I need to be clearer. Just, just but, to um, fully clarify yeah. it for everybody. But, but I don't, I think there's, um, there's people who like change because they like change. Mm. Um, but I genuinely believe that if you focus the right efforts around change, you can create brilliance. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is the motivational bit. So you are definitely on that camp. And then as, as a leader, what do you do consciously to help the people that are not quite the change junkies and they even listen to the word and they go, oh my God, what's we about to fundamentally shift in my life? I've seen people really, even the word quite triggers them and then yeah, I've seen yeah. people like yourself see it as an opportunity and what could be even better if yeah, the art yeah, of the possible yeah. so as a leader what do you do consciously to kind of take the other side of 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 that of that argument to, to see the opportunity so years and years ago um about when I was at Chessington I um I did a communication course and one of the things that really stuck in my mind um from it was a, the person leading the course put two mugs on a screen and asked me to describe them. And I described them maybe 10 points, 15 points, all of which articulated the differences between the two things as opposed to the similarities. Interesting. And so I became very, very aware of the fact I'm a differences person. I like that stuff to be different. I like stuff to change. And actually, quite often when I'm working with people, I do that same test. And some of the people I've worked with will get to almost complete similarities. Um, of the two mugs. Of the two things. They will look at the two and they say they're both mugs, they're both for drinking, they're both got a handle, whatever. Whereas mine would have been completely the opposite, like one's blue, one's green. What do they One's differ? got a cow, one's got another image on it, whatever. So there would have been a very different um, thought. So I, I quite often do that test with people so I understand where they're coming from. But um, the sort of extension of that conversation is I try and work out to what extent people like things mm. being different. Because if you want to change stuff and make, in my mind, make it better or improve, drive um, positive change, if that's what you're motivated by, you've got to be really aware of the fact that can be quite painful for other people. Mm. And you've got to think about how do you take them through that, um, that experience. Um, and that can be everything from the language of, right, this is a really great piece of work. How do we take it and evolve it on, mm. and make it better as opposed to, oh, let's do something totally different. So it can be anything from language through to just understanding. Because people who like change need some balance. Mm. Because if you don't have the people there to give you the structure and the discipline and to keep do all those things on the way, <laughs> keep you grounded, you, you need to have the, the yin and the yang, don't you? So it's, it's that awareness of their difference is important yeah, of course. to what yeah. you achieve. And also, I love what you said about the language and how even by just calling it the evolution rather than just the change, yeah, yeah, yeah. it has a very positive connotation. But also, sometimes people will tell you all the things that you need to hear. Mm. <laughs> that's quite helpful, right? Because then you become aware of what other people who don't have your natural tendencies think like and feel like. And then you adapt the way that you evolve and how you change things. And, um, and again, some of the people that I've been lucky enough to work with who I... I'm closest to either people who've been in my teams or peers or whatever, have totally different perspectives to me and have totally different ways of coming at the same problems. Um, frequently, we actually get to the same answer, but we will have gone a completely different route to get there. And it's that thought process, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Who's been the most inspirational person in your career, not just in Merlin, but since you started that graduate programme in Network Rail... How many years ago? 23? I don't think to that, <laughs> Let's not do math. <laughs> yeah, so that... Um, and the person that really, really inspired you to be the leader that you are today with, with all of those great... Um, I, I was pretty lucky quite early in my career to work for a guy um, called Rob. Um, it was when I was an operator when I used to run the Marks and Spencers. Um, and he 
had the exact right balance of challenge, demand, support. You never felt um, you never felt like you were quite finished on anything, but also you knew one hundred percent Rob had your back. That's brilliant. And um, and I think for me that that his he was considered he was um, caring. He was like I say that. That wouldn't have been enough for me unless he was super, super challenging at the same time. Um, and I think those things coming together is something that I've attempted to try and get into the way that I lead people now. How, what were some of the practical things he did to kind of demonstrate physically or even more subconsciously that I'm here for you, I've got your back? Oh, every everyone's one would start with, hi, how are you? And, and But not just like, hi, how are you, but hi, how are you and really meaning it and expecting an answer. Rather than just give me an answer, yeah. we'll move on yeah, to so the yeah, business right. stuff. <laughs> Don't move on. Um, and it's easy, isn't it, when you're super busy and everyone's super busy to move into functional and tasks mm. cause, because, of course, we have to have a lot of tasks and we have to get through them really fast. But th- just that, that simple starting, that caring about the individual before you move into the into the business piece, incredibly important. And, and I cannot think of a single time that ever didn't happen. Mm. Um but also, again, language style around, great job, have you thought about this? Do you know what? Recognition. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, but it's just the stuff that you should start with. Mm. And you still remember him, and that's like yeah, many yeah. years. Yeah, agreed. Many agreed. years. Um, one of the three Bs that Scott has introduced us to, and we're all kind of loving using in our language and in everything we do every day, is belonging. Yeah. What does it mean to you? Um, what does it mean to me? It means it's it's about being able to just be yourself, about knowing that it's okay to bring the good bits and the bad bits with you, mm. because like no one, no one gets it right all the time. It's about um, having people around you that you know care about you as an individual as well as a, a team member employee etc um it's about safety i think in its in its simplest possible form um it's the most obvious and intuitive thing to say but it's about knowing that you are okay to be you at work um and and also so you know you know that's not the case in every business I remember coming to Merlin, and one of the reasons probably I've been with Merlin for 15 years because it was the first place. When you grow up on the railway, you don't talk about your boyfriend. Mm. You just don't, right? It's just not a thing. Interesting. Um, be- and by the way, it might be very different now. I'm 22 years out of date, so I um, acknowledge that things have moved on a lot. Um, but actually, in contract catering, when I worked at an industry that you'd imagine would have been way more open, you didn't at the same time. Again, this was back in 2000. When I, when I came to Merlin, that 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 was free. That was that. Was, I wrote to um, I wrote to um, Nick when he left, and actually said the one thing that I don't think probably people said to you is there was never a point working for you that you ever cared about your sexuality or felt that that was ever going to inhibit your career. And he sent me a really nice note back. Um, but actually, I don't think that was true of every organisation in 20, mm. 20, 2007 when I joined. I mm. don't think that was true. Um, and we have great work going on now around diversity inclusion yes. in this business and it's brilliant and it's it's almost a shame we have to do that still in the world um but actually i think our starting point in merlin was always pretty good and therefore it f- I, f- I would hope the work we do makes sure more and more people feel like they can belong every single day yeah and that you can i, w- I think i read something from Brené brown that said belonging is the opposite of fitting in yeah or trying to fit in because you don't you just bring your true self well, that's right? the worst right isn't it trying to fit in and again, we have a parallel story because when I interviewed for Merlin four years ago, um, it was the first interview of my career that I spoke about my son having autism Amazing. and saying I need to have flexibility. Is that something that the organization is happy to support? And I, when I went in the car driving back home, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to get this job, but man, this is the first time I talked about it at yeah. interview stage. And I've been with another organization for five years prior to that. And they didn't even know. Wow. Isn't that interesting? But, it, and it's but that you feel that. Because, uh, yeah, the, you're so open every single day yeah. and transparent and you're yourself. 
And the fact that you couldn't be that somewhere else. For, for whatever reason, I wasn't ready to go, this is the case. Nuts, right? And then I go to an interview and I say that in the first 60 minutes yeah, as a, this is a non-negotiable. I thought... Th- but it should be, right? Because it's the single most important thing. It's, it's a non-negotiable. It, it, but it, the same as somebody's sexuality. Well, same as anything. Yeah. Because the, the single most important thing is actually you, right? Yeah. And you want to come and do brilliant things, but you want to do that in the context of your life outside yeah. of work as well. Yeah. And so the, the idea that you're working at a company, you were there for five years not able to yeah. talk about it. I hadn't spoken to anybody about it. it they probably will, will hear <laughs> They will hear it in this podcast. And I've put a lot on, um, on LinkedIn since yeah. I joined Merlin. But I've done it because of Sandra's work and everything that, you know, the Intel group do and, and how I felt that I belong and I'm not going to be judged or labelled by that. But it's, it's just been Merlin. So it's it's that it's magic it's of the organisation, isn't Merlin, it? It's Merlin, but it's also you. You've got to a point that you're ready to do it. Exactly. And that's really important because sometimes, like I, w- I wouldn't have sat talking about my dyslexia 10 years ago on this. Um, I wouldn't have talked about my sexuality 15 years ago on this. Sometimes it's about a moment in time where you're just ready to talk you and be yourself ready. and and. That's people's choices as well, right? A hundred percent. And it needs to be driven by them. Imagine we're in December 2023. You're just ready to put your out of office on for Christmas time. And you look back. What do you want the feeling to be? What do you want the feeling to be? I am... Um, good question. I, I thought you were going to ask, look forward, because I'd <laughs> like to be thinking at that moment, I'm going to go Let's do on, some reflection. I'm going to go and sit on let's, the beach or something. Let's imagine it's December, but um, that you're looking back. So listen, there's, there's quite a lot of um, new stuff going on at the moment, quite a lot of um, questions out there in the business, and there's some really brilliant questions. There's lots of... Um, Lots of things that I think we could have worked on historically that we cannot wait our focus on. And I guess what I'd like to think is over the space of this year is we take a lot of those opportunities and we've we've really thought them through, worked out what our plans are, got people behind them, whether it be rolling out retail hills globally everywhere, whether it be new training programs but we've really understood where do we want to go and what are what are the work streams that sit behind it Mm. and i'd just like to have played a part in making that really clear for people giving people clarity um giving them the tools they need what better tools can we give people to have a better time in their day-to-day work um what can we develop to give our guests better guests experience i'd like to think that i'd had a real impact on a number of those work streams i love that so, um, to, to close it off, I've got two questions for you. Go um, what do you need to do in the next eight months to make 2023 amazing personally and business-wise for you? Personal one's a big question, as you well know. Um, so there's quite a, lot, I, quite a lot of stuff that I think I need to do in um, this year personally. But I think um, to make both of those work, what I actually... Um, and I'm doing a lot of work on this at the moment is... Um, is balancing off the home life and the work life. So um, I am neurotic at the moment about exercising, about those long walks, about... Um, I've started to meditate. Who'd have thought that I'd ever meditate? It's amazing. I know, God, isn't it? It's right? amazing. So, so you can sort of spend <laughs> 10 minutes meditating. It can com- clear your mind. Resets and sort of your like, brain. And so, so I've done a, a bunch of stuff um, on that. I'm... Uh, um, from a personal perspective, I'm starting to work with a new uh, mentor, which is really exciting. Um, so there'll be, I think it's important, it's going to be important for me this year with change in my personal life and, and, and my home life too, um, and my work life to, uh, to really work on myself to make sure I'm coming in every single day ready to go, ready to, um, ready to lead people in, in that balanced way that, that I'd like to, um, ready to support colleagues in terms of some of the problems that are going to come their way that they probably don't even even know about um and then from a work perspective it's sort of a bit of a repetition on the question before which is i want to be there to help identify the key things that are going to make this business even better and i want to work with the teams to make sure that we can deliver against those opportunities problems whatever you you like to call them and uh, um and deliver the programs that start adding in the layers of um operational excellence, revenue management, whatever it might be, that just just make us better operators. And make us even more magical. The only one other question I wanted to ask you is, if Huel Matthias was a brand, what would that brand stand for? What do I stand for? Change, improvement, bringing together people around problems, making sure that um, we give simplicity to the organisation, right tools, right um, right processes, and getting to the point that we enable people to be even better than they knew they could be. And that's everything, right? 
And what would your mates say that your brand is? You know those people that organised that amazing French restaurant birthday party with loads of butter in the food? <laughs> well, um, they'd probably say that. Um, it'd be th- so that they... Um, it's interesting. So at work, and I've asked this question, you know people ask you in interviews, yeah. um, how do you describe yourself? And, and I've asked my team that, and they've always said high demand, high support, right? So I know that from my, t- from my team. Um, I think my friends would um, be a lot more in the high support. Mm. Um, they'd probably see a very different version of me. They'd talk to me a lot. They'd consider me to be obsessed by food, um, obsessed by travel, all the things that you talk about a lot more. In a MasterChef type way or like... Oh, I don't know whether I could do it. But I'd, <laughs> I'd love to have a go. Do we see go, like right? a Merlin I'd, episode I'd, I'd, coming I'd, up? I'd love to have a go. I did actually <laughs> want to get shortlisted for Come Dine With Me. Again, very UK-centric comment, but a, um, a show it's where a you... It's a brilliant programme. Is it? it David Lamb the is the best well, they, um, it's, <laughs> with it's, his it's, comments. It's a show where you invite people round to... to cook, for a dinner party. For a dinner party. And, and they, they score judge you. you, yeah. And they... they, 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 they I, I got to that. I got to right to the last moment. Um, and... Uh, um, and then they pulled out and they got my friend down the road to do it. Gutted. Gutted. So, uh, um, so no, <laughs> do you so still talk to your friend? 100%, yeah, 100%. <laughs> but like, we didn't know. We were doing it in parallel. I would love um, to be on that programme. Would you? So good. I'm not sure. Were you like in it to win it? Were you going for the oh, grand? Would, yeah, 100%. 100% going been, yeah. for the thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the way. Thank you so, so much for spending an hour of your time with me when I know things are crazy busy, demanding ever-changing um please continue to be the leader that i know you are really like creating the conditions for your people to succeed for them to get a mentor for them to get get coaching for them to be on the greatest leadership program for them to just have a chat about their development um and just continue being you authentic unfiltered no bs with the greatest jokes on the phone calls before the real phone call starts. Well, that's very kind. I'd also, um, I think you know this, but because so many of my team have been on your programmes, um, I think it's fair to say that you have made a massive difference to a lot of people at Merlin too, so you should continue with the exact same Thanks. stream. I have a question for you. Oh, hit me. I love a um, question. If, if we are going to become the greatest place to work, yes. What what more do we need to do in terms of training our teams and giving them the best opportunity um i'm going to repeat something scott said but i i agree with it uh wholeheartedly so when he came on excalibur he was amazed by the quality of the program the quality of the participants um we ended up having a two-hour conversation although we were scheduled for 30 minutes nikki biggs don't hate me i love you uh (laughs) But one of the things he said is that we do so much in the leadership space, a lot, uh, diverse stuff, uh, depending on grade location, online, in person, loads. Um, And we have this um, layer of people that he called the frozen middle. It's basically all of our first time managers. They've gone from a strong operator to a first time people leader. What do we do for them? And if, if I could replicate I love that. some of that leadership quality standard offering wowness um like craig came on the senior leader in action right craig has been with us for how many years six something like right that. and he's newly promoted came on yeah. the leadership induction he wrote in his evaluation form thank you for making me fall in love with merlin all over again yeah amazing i want that bottled for all of our managers and of course those first roles, <laughs> that would be the m- most amazing right those it's so important the most important they're the so ones important. that transform you and begin everything i i love it that would be my like if i could wave a magic magic wand a merlin wand and just kind of make it happen tomorrow every single one of our managers globally would have the same yeah, quality of learning and opportunity that our, um, you know, uh, grade B and above leaders have in the organisation. And I think the, the impact of that would be phenomenal. If Amazing. When, not if, when we achieve that. If I could just bring anybody to this podcast, who would you nominate? Oh, that's a bit unfair because I gave you the list of everyone I thought should be <laughs> on it already. Um, you gave me a list. Do you know, I think what would be lovely, because I gave you a list of people that I thought would be mm. 
interesting for people to hear mm. from. And, and they've actually, all got emails, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I've, <laughs> I've noticed a bunch of them on your list already. Um, but actually, I think what would be really nice is to pull some of those people you we were just talking about a minute ago, some of the early level managers, the managers, understanding their experience, what they think is great about Merlin, and also what they think the problems are. Because as a, as a team, if we can hear that, then there's more we can do about it. So I, I would be focusing on some of those brilliant Ooh, early I stage managers, that. learning a little bit more about First them. First time people leader anywhere in the organisation. And from different from different markets from around the world so we really hear oh, from some that. people from asia north america um etc i think it'd be great it's happening consider yeah. it done second half of the year jack we're traveling <laughs> thank you so much thank you